Before you hear the audio, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 7. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 7. OK, Greg. So, I finally managed to read the article you mentioned. The one about the study on gender in physics. About the study of college students done by Akira Miyaki and his team. Yeah, I was interested that the researchers were actually a mix of psychologists and physicists. That's an unusual combination. Yeah, I got a little confused at first about which students the study was based on. They weren't actually majoring in physics. They were majoring in what's known as the STEM disciplines. That's science, technology, engineering and... And math. Yes, but they were all doing physics courses as part of their studies. That's correct. So, as I understood it, Miyaki and co started from the fact that women are underrepresented in introductory physics courses at college. And also that, on average, the women who do enrol on these courses perform more poorly than the men. No one really knows why this is the case. Yeah, but what the researchers wanted to find out was basically what they could do about the relatively low level of the women's results. But in order to find a solution, they needed to find out more about the nature of the problem. Right. Now, let's see if I can remember... It was that in the physics class, the female students thought the male students all assumed that women weren't any good at physics. Was that it? And they thought that the men expected them to get poor results in their tests. That's what the women thought, and that made them nervous. So they did get poor results. But actually, they were wrong. No one was making any assumptions about the female students at all. Anyway, what Miyaki's team did was quite simple, getting the students to do some writing before they went into the physics class. What did they call it? Values affirmation. They had to write an essay focusing on things that were significant to them, not particularly to do with the subject they were studying, but more general things like music or people who mattered to them. Right. So the idea of doing the writing is that this gets the students thinking in a positive way. And putting these thoughts into words can relax them and help them overcome the psychological factors that lead to poor performance, yeah. But what the researchers in the study hadn't expected was that this one activity raised the women's physics grades from the C to the B range. A huge change. Pity it wasn't to an A, but still... No, but it does suggest that the women were seriously underperforming beforehand in comparison with the men. Yes. Mind you, Miyaki's article left out a lot of details. Like, did the students do the writing just once or several times? And had they been told why they were doing the writing? That might have affected the results. You mean, if they know the researchers thought it might help them to improve then they just try to fulfil that expectation? Exactly. Before you hear the audio, you have some time to look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen carefully and answer questions 8 to 10. So anyway, I thought for our project we could do a similar study, but investigate whether it really was the writing activity that had that result. OK, so we could ask them to do a writing task about something completely different, something more factual, like a general knowledge topic. Maybe, or we could have half the students doing a writing task and half doing something else, like an oral task. Or even half do the same writing task as in the original research and half do a factual writing task. Then we'd see if it really is the topic that made the difference 
or something else. That's it. Good. So at our meeting with the supervisor on Monday, we can tell him we've decided on our project. We should have our aims ready by then. I suppose we need to read the original study. The article's just a summary. And there was another article I read by Smolinski. It was about her research on how women and men perform in mixed teams in class, compared with single sex teams and on their own. Let me guess. The women were better at teamwork. That's what I expected, but actually, the men and the women got the same results, whether they were working in teams or on their own. But I guess it's not that relevant to us. What worries me, anyway, is how we're going to get everything done in the time. We'll be okay now. We know what we're doing, though. I'm not clear how we assess whether the students in our experiment. Actually, make any progress or not? No, we may need some advice on that. The main things to make sure we have the right size sample, not too big or too small. That shouldn't be difficult. Right. What do we need to do next? We could have a look at the timetable for the science classes, or perhaps we should just make an appointment to see one of the science professors. That'd be better. Great. And we could even get to observe one of the classes. What for? Well, okay, maybe let's just go with your idea. Right. Well, I think that's everything. Part two. You will hear a head teacher talking to parents of pupils about changes at the school. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to fifteen. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to fifteen. Good morning, and thank you for coming here today. I'd like to bring you up to date with changes in the school that will affect your children. As you know, the school buildings date from various times: some from the nineteen seventies, some from the last five years. And of course, Dartfield House is over a century old. It was commissioned by a businessman, Neville Richards, and intended as his family home, but he died before it was completed. His heir chose to sell it to the local council, who turned it into offices. A later plan to convert it into a tourist information centre didn't come about through lack of money, and instead. It formed the nucleus of this school when it opened forty years ago. The school has grown as the local population has increased, and I can now give you some news about the lower school site, which is separated from the main site by a road. Planning permission has been granted for development of both sites. The lower school will move to new buildings that will be constructed on the main site. Developers will construct houses on the existing lower school site. Work on the new school buildings should start within the next few months. A more imminent change concerns the catering facilities and the canteen. The canteen is always very busy throughout the lunch period. In fact, it's often full to capacity, because a lot of our pupils like the food that's on offer there. But there's only one serving point, so most pupils have to wait a considerable time to be served. This is obviously unsatisfactory, as they may have hardly finished their lunch before afternoon lessons start. So, we've had a new food hall built, and this will come into use next week. It'll have several serving areas, and I'll give you more details about those in a minute. But one thing we ask you to do to help in the smooth running of the food hall is to discuss with your children each morning which type of food they want to eat that day, 
so they can go straight to the relevant serving point. There won't be any junk food, everything on offer will be healthy, and there's no change to the current system of paying for lunches by topping up your child's electronic payment card online. You may be wondering what will happen to the old canteen. We'll still have tables and chairs in there, and pupils can eat food from the food hall or lunch they've brought from home. Eventually, we may use part of the canteen for storage, but first, we'll see how many pupils go in there at lunchtime. Before you hear the audio, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen carefully and answer questions 16 to 20. Hi Rob, how's the course going? Oh, hi Mia. Yeah, great. I can't believe the first term's nearly over. <laughs> I saw your group's performance last night at the student theatre. It was good. Really? Yeah, but now we have to write a report on the whole thing, an in-depth analysis. I don't know where to start. Like, I have to write about the role I played, the doctor, how I developed the character. Well, what was your starting point? Uh, my grandfather was a doctor before he retired, and I just based it on him. OK, but how? Uh, did you talk to him about it? He must have all sorts of stories, but he never says much about his work, even now. He has a sort of authority, though. Mm. So, how did you manage to capture that? I'd... I'd visualise what he must have been like in the past when he was sitting in his consulting room, listening to his patients. OK, so that's what you explain in your report. Right. Then there's the issue of atmosphere. So in the first scene, we needed to know how boring life was in the doctor's village in the 1950s. So when the curtain went up on the first scene in the waiting room... There was that long silence before anyone spoke. And then people kept saying the same thing over and over, like, cold, isn't it? Yes, and everyone wore grey and brown and just sat in a row. Yes, all those details of the production. Mm. And I have to analyse how I functioned in the group, what I found out about myself. I know I was so frustrated at times when we couldn't agree. Mm. Yes, so did one person emerge as the leader? Sophia did. That was OK. She helped us work out exactly what to do for the production. And that made me feel better, I suppose. When you understood what needed doing? Yes. And Sophia did some research, too. That was useful in developing our approach. Like what? Well, she found these articles from the 1950s about how relationships between children and their parents or between the public and people like bank managers or the police were shifting. Interesting. And did you have any practical problems to overcome? Well, in the final rehearsal, everything was going fine until the last scene. That's where the doctor's first patient appears on stage on his own. The one in the wheelchair? Yes, and he had this really long speech, with the stage all dark except for one spotlight. Mm. And then that stuck somehow, so it was shining on the wrong side of the stage. But anyway, we got that fixed, thank goodness. Yes, it was fine on the night. You'll hear Rebecca Bramwell, an artist and illustrator, giving advice on how to get your first job or commission as an artist. Before you hear the audio, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. I'd like to introduce Rebecca Bramwell, an artist and illustrator who has come along today to talk to you all about getting your first job or commission as an artist. Over to you, Rebecca. Thank you for inviting me. I remember when I graduated back in 1983, I was very excited about getting my first commission. My degree was in fine art and I'd worked long and hard to get it. 
I was an enthusiastic student, and I never found it difficult to find the incentive to paint. I think as a student, you're pushed along by fellow students and tutors, and the driving force is there. However, when you leave college, you find yourself saying things like. I'll have one more cup of coffee and then I'll sit down to work. <laughs> I-, I hate to admit it, but I say it myself. Suddenly, it isn't finding the inspiration or getting the right paper that's a problem. It's you. In my view, there are a number of reasons why this happens. It's a real challenge making a decent living as a new artist. You have to find a market for your work. Often you work freelance and need to take samples or portfolios of your work from place to place. These experiences are common to a lot of professional people, but artists also have to bare their souls to the world in a way. More than anything, they want praise. If people don't like what they create, then it can be a very emotional and upsetting experience hearing them say this. I began to realise. That these problems were preventing me from having a career in art, and so I decided to experiment. I was a painter, but I started to dabble in illustration, drawing pictures for books, cards, and this offered me the opportunity to become more emotionally detached from my work. I was no longer producing images from the heart, but developing images for a specified subject, taking a more practical. Approach. I began to develop a collection of my illustrations, which I put into a portfolio and started to carry around with me to show prospective clients and employers. But it was still tricky because publishers, for example, want to know that your drawings will reproduce well in a book, but without having had any work published, it's hard to prove this. Having a wonderful portfolio or a collection of original artwork is, of course, a first step. But what most potential clients would like to see is printed artwork, and without this evidence, they tend to hold back still when it comes to offering a contract. Before you hear the audio, you have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-six to thirty. Good afternoon, Dave. Come on in and take a seat. Hi, Doctor Green. Thanks. Oh, hang on a minute. I'll just find the first draft of your project paper, and we can have a look at it together. Now, yours is the one on work placement, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. So, what made you choose that for your project? Well. I suppose it was because sending students off to various companies for work experience seems to be such a typical part of educational courses these days. I mean, even school kids get to do it. But I felt everyone just kind of assumes it's a good thing, and I guess I wanted to find out if that's the case. But you don't look at schools or colleges, right? You've stuck to university placement schemes. Yeah. Well, I quickly found that I had to limit my research, otherwise the area was just too big. Do you think that was okay? I think it's very sensible, especially as the objectives might be very different. So, how many schemes did you look at? Well, I sent out about 150 questionnaires altogether. You know, 50 of each to university authorities, students, and companies, and I got responses from 15 educational institutions, and、uh, 30 students in 11 individual companies. Great. That sounds like a good sample. And who did you send your company questionnaires to? Well, the idea was to have them done by the students' line managers, but sometimes they were filled in by the human resources manager, or even the owner of the company. Right. I didn't find a full list anywhere, so I think it's very important to provide that. Really, you can put it as an appendix at the back. Right. I've got a record of all the respondents, so that'll be easy. I hope other things were okay. I mean. I've already put such a lot of work into this project, identifying the companies and so on. Oh, I can tell. I think you've done a good job overall. Before you hear the audio, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to thirty-five.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 35. So how do you go about investigating something like this? Well, Dr Bialystok used groups of monolingual and bilingual subjects aged from 30 right up to 88. For one experiment, she used a computer program which displayed either a red or a blue square on the screen. The coloured square could come up on either the left hand or the right hand side of the screen. If the square was blue, the subject had to press the left shift key on the keyboard and if the square was red, they had to press the right shift key. So they didn't have to react at all to the actual position of the square on the screen, just to the colour they saw. And she measured the subject's reaction times by recording how long it took them to press the shift key and how often they got it right. What she was particularly interested in was whether it took the subject longer to react when a square lit up on one side of the screen, say the left, and the subject had to press the shift key on the right-hand side. She'd expected that it would take more processing time than if a square lit up on the left and the candidates had to press a left key. This was because of a phenomenon known as the Simon effect, where basically the brain gets a bit confused because of conflicting demands being made on it. In this case, seeing something on the right and having to react on the left. And this causes a person's reaction times to slow down. The results of the experiment showed that the bilingual subjects responded more quickly than the monolingual ones. That was true both when the squares were on the correct side of the screen, so to speak, and even more so when they were not. So bilingual people were better able to deal with the Simon effect than the monolingual ones. So what's the explanation for this? Well, the result of the experiment suggests that bilingual people are better at ignoring information which is irrelevant to the task in hand and just concentrating on what's important. One suggestion given by Dr Bialystok was that it might be because someone who speaks two languages can suppress the activity of parts of the brain when it isn't needed. In particular, the part that processes whichever language isn't being used at that particular time. Well, she then went on to investigate that with a second experiment. But again, the bilingual group performed better. And what was particularly interesting, and this is, I think, why the experiments have received so much publicity, is that in all cases, the performance gap between monolinguals and bilinguals actually increased with age, which suggests that bilingualism protects the mind against decline. So, in some way, the lifelong experience of managing two languages may prevent some of the negative effects of ageing. So, that's a very different story from the early research. So, what are the implications of this for education? Before you hear the audio, you have some time to look at questions 36 to 37. Now listen carefully and answer questions 36 to 37. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the first in this year's series of public lectures offered by the Art Gallery. As chief curator of the gallery, I was given the honor of presenting the first lecture, and let me tell you, I had a difficult time deciding what to talk about tonight. Being the curator, I naturally know just about everything that's in this gallery, but I wanted to choose an artist who has a wide appeal. That seems only fair, yes? But I didn't want to talk about someone so well-known that anything I said would be familiar. I wanted someone modern. My personal preference is for modern art. But again, I wanted to choose someone who had the potential to appeal to all art lovers, whether they're attracted to traditional forms, impressionism, surrealism, or what have you. Before you hear the audio, you have some time to look at questions 38 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 38 to 40. So, having spent the last five years as a visiting professor in Barcelona, it's not surprising that I finally chose to talk about one of the greatest Catalan artists, one whose work is likely to be familiar to many of you, Juan Miró. Look at this, and this. 
And this. Ring any bells? Miro's most famous and most widely reproduced works tend to be like this. Bright primary colors with lots of asymmetrical forms. He painted on large canvases, larger than himself quite often, and his paintings depicted birds, trees, flowers, and other features of the natural world. But Miro produced a great variety of work, and it's about some of his lesser-known paintings that I would like to speak this evening. 